Yeah, just hold it up. Oh. The closer you hold it, the less echo there will be. Oh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Hada. Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Hadana, Lihada, Wama Kunna, Linahtadia, Lola, and Hadana Allah. Wa Ashadu and La Ilaha Illa Allah. وحده لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وأشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وقليله أرسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عسيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار يقول الله عز وجل وهو أصدق القائلين في كتابه الكريم إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعظكم به إن الله كان سميعا بصيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول وأولي الأمر منكم وإن تنازعتم في شيء فردوه إلى الله والرسول إن كنتم مؤمنين إن كنتم, يو... إن كنتم مؤمنين بالله واليوم الآخر ذلك خير وأحسن تأويلا Brothers and sisters Committed Muslims To continue on with the subject of last week's talk, we intend to pursue giving some more information about the characters, about the character and the deeds of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. We want to get a better idea of the kind of person he was and the kind of things that he did. For it was the Muawiyah precedent 
that is being used today by contemporary kings and princes to legitimize a program of tyranny and oppression. The first step that they take is to erroneously characterize him as a Sahabi. And then the next step is that they say that the actions of those who lived in the first two or three generations after Allah's Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam that the actions of the Sahaba in these first two or three generations established a standard of behavior for all generations of Muslims to come. And so before we get into his specific actions and policies, let us set things up with a conversation that took place between Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas and Walid ibn Uqba. In the second part of Uthman's administration, Uthman being the third successor to Allah's Prophet, in the latter half of his administration, he began to replace key political figures in the Islamic State with members of his own family. One of these key figures happened to be the governor of Al-Kufa. And obviously I'm referring to Saad ibn Abi Waqqas. And so Uthman chose to replace him with, with Walid ibn Uqba. And so he sent Walid to Al-Kufa with a message to Saad. And the content of this message was that Saad would be relieved of his governorship in Kufa and that he would be replaced by Walid. And so when Walid got there to Saad and gave him this message, Saad responded by saying the following. I don't know if you have gotten a lot smarter and whether we have gotten a lot stupider. And so this and to this Walid responded by saying Do not be angry Abu Ishaq. For we are now in the midst of a monarchy. In the morning, someone will assume the position of authority, and in the evening, it will be someone else. And so to, so to this, Saad responded by saying, 
I realize that you people will most certainly change it into a monarchy. And so when Saad said, you people, he was obviously referring to Bani Umayyah. And so the first question is, that if at that time, the companions of Allah's Prophet knew the difference between a monarchy and a khilafah. And they were the standard bearers of all generations of Muslims to come. Then why is it today that we have a sar- such a hard time distinguishing between a monarchy and a khilafah? In the midst of it, they knew at that time what was going on. There was a corruption taking place. And they were able to put their finger on the nature and the character of this corruption. And so this was a portent of what was to come. And so now let us fast forward to some years later, at the time of Imam Ali, when he had just been popularly designated as the Imam the Amir al Mu'mineen of all of the Muslims. And so he received the bay'ah from all places except for two. One of them being Mecca and the other one being Asham. And as far as the governor of Asham was concerned, he said that the precondition for him to give his bayah was for Imam Ali to extradite the killers of Uthman to Asham so that the governor of Asham could kill them. And that unless he did that, there would be no bay'ah coming from Asham. And so now let us analyze this demand. First of all, note that Muawiyah is not asking the central authority to arrest the killers, prosecute them and punish them. He is asking or demanding of the central authority in Medina, meaning the administration of Imam Ali, to send the killers to Asham. Now the murder of Uthman was a crime against the Muslim people, a crime against the state. And so it falls within the jurisdiction of the central authority of the state to prosecute the killers. This is not in the domain of any particular governorship of the Islamic State. And so Muawiyah knew very well that it was impossible for Imam Ali to extradite the killers to Asham.
And because he was certain that that would never take place, what was lurking in the back of his mind is that he never intended to give the bayah. This practice of a tribal authority seeking vengeance or seeking a blood vengeance it was a practice that was ended by Allah's Prophet it was a practice that was not continued by the first three successors to Allah's Prophet and nor was it a practice that was endorsed by Imam Ali. But you can see by Muawiyah's demand that he did not care. He did not have any fealty towards prosecuting a crime. according to the method of Allah's Prophet and according to the methodology of the revelation that he got from Allah. In a sense, this person wanted to take the law in his own hands. And not just a generation before, there was an example of those during the lifetime of Allah's Prophet who wanted to take the law into their own hands. And for this reason, the Hurub al ridda were conducted. There were these people who at the end of the lifetime of Allah's Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wa salam refused to put their zakah in the central treasury, the Baytul Mal of the Islamic State. And they said that they wanted to distribute this zakah by themselves in their own territory. However, Allah's Prophet and his first successor, Abu Bakr, would have none of this. They would not permit any faction to take the law into their own hands. And Imam Ali followed the same policy. In the 25th year of the Hijrah, this would be a couple of years into the administration of Rahman. Muawiyah married a woman by the name of Maysoon bint Baj Maysoon bint Bajdal Al Kulaybi. Now there are a couple of things that have to be said about this marriage. First of all, this woman was the mother of Yazid. The second and the more important thing is that this woman was a Christian. And in all the sources of Islamic historical information, there is not one citation that suggests that this woman ever accepted Islam. In fact, after the marriage took place, she went back to her tribe, Bani Kulayb. And a year after the marriage took place, 
Yazid was born. And it is also known from Islamic historical information. These are the Islamic books of history. That Yazid did not join his father in Damascus until he was 15 or 16 years old. And so this suggests that until he was to the age of 15 or 16, he spent that time with his mother within the confines of a Christian domain. And so for the, his first 15 or 16 years, he was basically raised as a Christian. Now this enters into a sensitive area. Of the way things ought to be conducted. In an Islamic state, at an Islamic political level. And so the question here is, Should a high-ranking political official within the Islamic State, whether he is a head of state, a governor, or in a sensitive cabinet position within the Islamic State, should that official be allowed to marry a non-Muslim. Now we know from the ayat of the Qur'an that license has been given to Muslim males to be able to marry muhsanat from Ahl al-Kitab. Muhsanat literally are fortified women, morally pure women. And so license has been given to Muslim males to marry Muhsanat from Ahl al-Kitab. But at the same time, Allah says, يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء بعضهم أولياء بعض فمن يتولهم منكم فإنه منهم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين O oh, you who are securely committed to Allah do not take political Jews and political Christians as your sponsors, your allies, and your confidants. Okay, so now we ask the question. That when you have a head of state, or a governor, or a minister, who happens to be dealing with sensitive information, with state secrets, with state strategies? Should he be consorting with somebody who is a Christian or a Jew who has no intention of declaring their Islamic commitment to Allah and His Messenger? Which ayah takes precedence in this particular case? And should any Muslim official in such a sensitive capacity or a high-ranking position be allowed to have a spouse who is not a Muslim? And yet this has been happening 
in our history and the first king in Muslim history in a sense legalized and in another sense legitimized such practices another incident in the life of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan to help, our, to help us understand what kind of person he was. In his last few years, and he ruled for 20 years, as the first king in Muslim history. In his last few years, he began to conduct a campaign to secure the oath of allegiance for his son Yazid from the provinces of the Islamic domain. And specifically as far as Al Kufa is concerned. He sent a person by the name of Mughira ibn Shu'bah. to Al-Kufa to see if he could collect a set of influential people who would give the oath of allegiance to Yazid after the death of his father Muawiyah. And so this Mughira ibn Shu'bah, he found 10 influence peddlers in Al Kufa. And he gave them 30,000 dinars to give the oath of allegiance to Yazid. And he instructed them to go as a group to Muawiyah in Damascus and to tell him in person that they are ready to give the oath of allegiance to Yazid. Now let us understand what's going on here. When Mughira focused on these ten people, he was going after people who carried the weight of opinion in society. So that if these ten give their oath of allegiance, then they are likely to carry public opinion with them. In a sense, you could say that these ten were the media personalities of the day. And the oath, and the allegiance, and the loyalty of these media personalities could be bought for a price. Has, and has anything changed after 1400 years? Aren't these influence peddlers, these media personalities, are they not around today? 
And is there loyalty not available to be bought by the highest bidder? The second thing, when these ten went to Damascus and they stood in front of Muawiyah and gave their oath of allegiance to Yazid, Muawiyah asked the head of the delegation, How much money did Mughira give to you? So they said 30,000 dinars. And so Muawiyah's response Your oath of allegiance can be bought very cheaply. And so now let us consider this statement. First of all, what does it mean in today's economics to give 30,000 dinars? What is 30,000 dinars equivalent to in today's dollars? Just so that we can understand what's going on here. One dinar is equivalent to about four and a quarter grams of gold. A dinar was a gold coin. Today's price of gold is forty dollars per gram. That makes one dinar equivalent to about one hundred and seventy dollars. That means that thirty thousand dinars is equivalent to five point one million dollars. And Muawiyah is saying, we bought your loyalty very cheaply. Meaning that he could have given a lot more. And it is not clear by the wording in Islamic historical sources whether these 30,000 dinars were given to the aggregate of 10 or whether 30,000 dinars was given to each of them separately. Based on what Muawiyah said, meaning, if you get the gist of his words, that this 30,000 dinars was just pocket change for him. It is more likely that he gave 30,000 dinars to each of these ten, suggesting that he paid a bribe of 50 million dollars to buy the loyalty of the opinion makers in Al Kufa and this was just one province there was Egypt there was Al Basra there was the peninsula and there were other provinces he even offered 100,000 dirhams to Abdullah ibn Umar in Al Medina, but he refused. And so now we have another question. How does a public servant, regardless of how long he has been in that capacity, acquire this kind of wealth? I'm going to quote a hadith and you're probably not going to hear this hadith from those 
who consider Muawiyah to be a companion of Allah's Prophet. For if they delegitimize him as a companion, then they would be very happy to quote this hadith. But given that they consider him to be a companion for political purposes, you will never hear this kind of hadith quoted from the members and the pulpits of those masjids. that legitimize the policies of tyranny, oppression, embezzlement and deception. This hadith, it appears in both Al-Bukhari and Muslim and it goes as follows, I'll read the Arabic first. Then I'll translate into English. ما من وال يلي رعية من المسلمين فيموت وهو فيموت وهو غاش لهم إلا حرم الله عليه الجنة. Any ruler. Who is in charge of any affair of the Muslim public? If he dies while he is engaged in a program of deception and embezzlement against the Muslim public, then Allah will not allow him to enter paradise. And so today, if we look in the world around, you have in the majority Muslim world, and perhaps the world in general, institutional programs of embezzlement and deception by those who claim leadership status in the world. There are kings and princes who consider the public treasury to be their personal fortune. And this precedent was started in our history by Awan Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And so we asked just a second ago, how is it possible for a public servant to build up this kind of wealth? Well, there is an answer in what he did. During the time that he was the head of state for that 20 years, the domain of Islam was still expanding. And there were a lot of non-Muslims in the peripheries of that domain that were still entering as new Muslims into Islam. And so there was a jihad that was a continuous feature of that 20 years. And so with jihad, as the Muslims were gaining victory after victory, there was the anfal, the spoils of war, that were accompanying every victory.
And so at the time of Allah's Prophet, and at the time of his first four successors, the Anfal were distributed amongst the Muslim public. But what did this character, Muawiyah, do? And I encourage you, brothers and sisters, don't take my word for it. You go yourself to the history books and you confirm and corroborate what I'm saying. I'm just not pulling this out of a hat. All of this information is in most, if not all, of the mainstream Islamic history books. And so Muawiyah instituted a policy that all of the gold and the silver of the spoils of war would be his share. And everything else, if there is anything else, would be distributed amongst the Muslim public. There were a lot of non-Muslims who were entering into the Islamic domain. Some of them chose to enter into a treaty arrangement with the Islamic State. Meaning that they decided to accept the protection of the Islamic State but not to become Muslims. In which case, they had to pay the jizya. In the other case, there were those who decided to become Muslims and become full-fledged citizens of the Islamic State. And so what kind of policy did Awan Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan institute with regard to these new entries into the Islamic State? He continued to levy the jizya on those who became Muslims. And there is a very clear statement from Allah's Prophet Again, I'll say in the Arabic Laysa ala al-Muslimi jizya You cannot levy jizya upon a Muslim This hadith is narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas and it is located in the Sunan of Abi Dawood. And so here we have a policy which is in clear violation of the social law practiced by Allah's Prophet. A direct opposite, a direct contradiction, an interdiction of Allah's Prophet. What was his excuse? That these people are just becoming Muslims in order to avoid paying the jizya. And so that, to that we say, so what? You're, are you going to say in mass that you know the hearts of all these people? 
the majority of whom are escaping oppression from their original home communities and entering into the Islamic State. And you're going to say that they're becoming Muslims just to avoid paying the jizya? In reality, what was happening is that by these people becoming Muslims, there was a reduction in the amount of monies and finances and assets that were coming into the Islamic treasury. And these kings and princes, these people who felt they had a birthright, they couldn't tolerate a reduction in their luxuries. And in this regard, his administration actually prevented a lot of people from becoming Muslims so that they could continue paying the jizya. And there are many, many more things to say about the Muawiyah precedent. I don't know if there is enough time to cover every single violation of Allah's words and the social commitment of His Prophet. قول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه يغفر لكم فاسترشدوه يرشد الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We are talking about the Muawiyah precedent because this historical information is very very important in helping us understand the mindset of the contemporary kings and princes. Who are oppressing, tyrannizing and terrorizing majority Muslim populations. Key amongst, Key amongst these state these terrorists, terrorists and tyrants, and tyrants is, the is the regime in Arabia. They are the ones, are the ones who have no qualms about using Islamic historical information, Islamic theological information to rationalize and to justify their tyranny and oppression as if such behavior is grounded in Islamic sources. The founder of that kingdom, Abdul Aziz ibn Abdul Rahman al Saud, 
He was a patron of British colonialism. And it was that patronage relationship that established that ugly and dysfunctional kingdom. It is said that on his way to becoming the first king of that kingdom, of that nation state, that he was being given 50,000 pounds sterling per month over the course of some 10 to 15 odd years. If you go back 100 years, 50,000 pounds sterling was a lot of money. And so British colonialism gave him money, a wealth of arms, and a wealth of military intelligence to occupy the entire peninsula. And the practice of this Abdul Aziz was to go into a particular territory and kill the heads of the tribes whose territory he was occupying. And in order to consolidate his position, he would marry into the family of the defeated tribal chiefs. And in this process, it is said, that he married 135 virgins. If it's possible in your lifetime to marry, quote unquote marry, put that in quotes, 135 women. In addition to that, he had 100 concubines, many of whom were Africans, Yemeni, and women from Central Asia. And it is said out of these relationships that he had an innumerable number of daughters. And that officially he had 43 to 50 sons. Now we have to understand again what this officially means. For within Saudi exceptionalism and racism, any son born to what they consider to be a non-Arab, that means to what they consider to be lesser races, like the Africans or the Yemenis or the women from Central Asia, that these were considered to be quote-unquote lesser sons. And again, he had an innumerable number of lesser sons. And this is the person who claims to be the custodian of the Haramein. And this is the person whose progeny represent themselves as the custodians of the Haramein? They have turned Saad ibn Abi Waqqas's statement around. They take a look at the world's Muslim public. And they say, I don't know if you've become more stupid or we've become more smart.
إن الله يأمركم أن تؤدوا الأمانات إلى أهلها وإذا حكمتم بين الناس أن تحكموا بالعدل إن الله نعم يعظكم به إن الله كان سميع بصيرا Allah commands you it is an imperative you don't have a choice in the matter that when you designate people in decision making positions that you ought to choose people who are capable of performing that function and if you choose or if you acquiesce to those who are incapable then prepare yourselves for a condition that you are not going to be able to tolerate and a condition where you are going to suffer pain and punishment Leadership is a cooperative and a collaborative effort. It requires our involvement. And if we separate ourselves from this important function in society, if we do not take an interest in who is making our public decisions and who we are grooming to make our public decisions then we can set ourselves up for the kind of failure and the kind of dysfunction and the kind of regression that we are experiencing in the world today Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa zuqna al-tiba'a وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب دعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنا وفي الآخرة حسنا وقنا عذاب النار ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك سميع, إنك سميع مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك سميع مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في هسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم عباد الله إن الله يقر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة
the what is one doing this? Hold this thing so that I can 